I'm Stephen Feinberg, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Film and TV Office. Tonight, our guest is a local writer, director, and producer who made a groundbreaking movie 25 years ago and has gone on to work with such luminaries as Robert Duvall, Dustin Hoffman, Dennis Franz, Alec Baldwin, and many more. It is my pleasure to welcome Rhode Island native and filmmaker Michael Carrenti to the table of Double Feature. Great to see you, Michael. Same here, Stephen. So you've been like traveling back and forth, Los Angeles, Rhode Island. New York. New York. Yeah. And now you're, you're home because you're working on something. I am. I'm home for the uh, foreseeable future uh, based on things that are that are happening right that now. That are cooking. You've got some that stuff are cook cooking. Yeah, cooking. There you go. <laughs> um, so, Michael, let's just uh, give the audience a little sense of your background. You're from Pawtucket, right? Yeah. And you were raised in Pawtucket? I was raised in Pawtucket and then moved to Coventry. Yeah. Went to high school in Coventry. And although it seems like I spent most of my life there, it was only four years. And, you know, then moved uh, away to New York and uh, sort of got started from there. And did you always know you wanted to get into theater, film? Because I know you you dived a little bit into Trinity Theater. Yeah. yeah, that's how it started in high school in Coventry. An English teacher, Miss Marciano, actually. Uh, Trinity Rep had that Project Discovery program, which they still have, and it was it was early in, in the, the, the program. And they bust kids in from everywhere in the state to see live theater. Right. And I wasn't going. I had no interest in going to the theater. She mm -hmm. said, it's theater, and yes, you're going. Get on the bus. Yep. And so she, you know, dragged me on the bus, and we drove into Providence and sat there and watched A Man for All Seasons. Wow. The lights came up, and that show changed my life. It hooked you in? I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. Back on, on the way home in the bus, she, she came over and said, what did you think? I said, yeah. That was all right. She said, oh, you didn't like it? She, she'd know. Yeah. I said, I, well, it was okay, but I could, I could never do anything like that. She said, why couldn't you? Everybody on that stage got an education. You could do it. Lo and behold, four years later, I was at school at Trinity Rep in the conservatory. Were you interested in the acting part or all directing? I started out interested in acting and did well until, um, interestingly enough, my acting teacher, Larry Arick, said, uh, I started reading all these plays, Strindberg, Chekhov, Shakespeare, and I thought, oh, no, this really isn't for me. And Larry Arick handed me a play, and he said, here, read this. I said, a Western? He said, no, dummy, just read it. It was a play called American Buffalo. True story. By David Mamet. By David Mamet. Who would have thought, however many years later, I'd go on to direct that movie in Pawtucket with Dustin Hoffman. Wow. First play piece of directing I ever did was a scene from that play. Isn't that amazing? And then, then uh, it changed my life. Let's talk about Federal Hill. Sure. It started out as a one-act play, uh, and then I t it became a two-act uh, two play, a full-length play called Not For Nothing. Yeah. And then I decided to, through encouragement from a bunch of people, uh, turn it into a screenplay called Federal Hill. Um, and it got shopped around, and Robert Downey Sr., Robert Downey Jr.'s dad, mm -hmm. who's a friend, read the script and said, you need to direct this, Michael. This is your story. You'll, you'll kill this. He said, and it was his idea. He said, and to separate it from everything else, you should shoot it in black and white. So Bob Downey Sr. is the, the gentleman who suggested wow. I make it as a film and that I shoot it in black and white. I took his advice and, and uh, made the film. It was, uh, it was quite an experience. You know, it, it, I took something Adrian Hall said to me from Trinity Rep so many years before that. He, in his sort of Texas drawl, said to me, you know, honey, you got to fill up your well. Keep filling up your well. And then one day you'll start taking things out of it. So there I was in the middle of Atwell's Avenue, uh, shooting the scene and firing on all cylinders creatively. And I'm, I looked over at somebody and they, I said, I'm actually taking things out of my well right now. And they looked at me like I was absolutely insane yeah. and thought, oh, he's, he's gone beyond the bend. It's over. <laughs> right. And I realized what he meant. And it was that foundation from Trinity Rep that really gave me the, uh, the tools that I needed to, to, to make films. Right, right. Come on, Max, where's my three all the way? Frank, he don't come in can you? Yeah, I know, I know. I'm starving here. Come on. I hope you got a choke on 
the volume at all. That's a bastard. Frankie, how do you eat those things? It's pop up. It's a bath. Alfie's. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, I know that. But I want to know what his story is. He works laying bricks with his uncle and his father, the Carbones, you know. Ralph's a little crazy, but he's a good kid. Don't f***ing lie to me, Frankie. Don't ever f***ing lie to me. Ralph Carbone's a thief, you know that. I, I, all right, he, he whacks the house once in a while, but he don't tell me about it. I'm not with him all the time. This kid's way out of line, Frankie. I'm trying to tell you something. I want to have a talk with him, and I want you to get him here as soon as possible. Okay, Dad, whatever you say. You, you started to understand your tool chest. Yes, and I, the foundation for, for me in any film that I've ever written or directed or produced is about the characters yep. and, and about telling the stories honestly as you can. Now, on a film like that, because you had a pretty much, it was a micro budget, right? 80,000. 80,000. So did you spend a lot of time rehearsing beforehand so you weren't spending the money with all these people working with you and... Maybe a yep. lot of them were volunteer crew. I don't know where you were. $80,000 is not much money to make a movie. Everybody got paid, believe it or not. Um, yep. And we shot it in 35 millimeter black and white. But to your point, rehearsal was essential. I was living in Manhattan, and we rehearsed for five weeks in New York, four days a week, yep. five hours a day in my apartment, the whole cast. And then prior to shooting, I brought the entire cast of all those guys, put them in one apartment over in Fox Point, they all lived together. Yeah. And we rehearsed on every location every day. So when it came time to shoot the movie, yeah. the cinematographer was like, okay, ready, let's go. So we do a take, and it was perfect because these guys have been rehearsing for eight weeks. That's fantastic. And it helped a lot. And, and your cinematographer, was he also part of the rehearsal working? Uh, when we got to Rhode Island, Richard Crudo, who shot most of the films I've made, yep. uh, was on the set every day. Yep. And he would watch us as we walked through it. And I storyboarded. I, I took no chances. Right. There was nothing left. You were prepared. It had to be. Did you get help? Or is that... Boy, my cinematographer. I yep. trusted him. Yep. Uh, I dealt primarily with the performances. We agreed on the look before we started shooting. We looked at many films. Yep. And we agreed that this is what the picture would look like. How the, the, the tone, the style, and the movement. So there wasn't a lot of moving cameras. It was all very slow tableaus and the performances in the frame. Mezzanine, where, yes. the, where the characters yes. are moving in and up. And Mezzanine. Mezzanine, mm -hmm. where you're moving yes. in. We're yes. doing a little bit of... Yes. Yes, okay. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, so then you you finished the film. Yes. And did you have a game plan? You know, it's funny. It's Sherry Redstone, Sumner's daughter, who now runs the uh, Viacom right. uh, empire, uh, so I took the film when it was completed, and I drove it to uh, uh, to Dedham, to the National Amusements headquarters. Right, right. And I walked in with the two cans, <laughs> and I put it up on the counter, and some guy walks up to me, and he says, what is this? I said, well, it's a movie I made. They said, what studio? Who are you delivering it for? I said, no, actually, I made it. I'd like you guys <laughs> to see it. In my dopey head, I thought, well, the showcase cinemas, they show movies. They'll look at my movie, and they'll show it. So the head booker comes out, Judd Parker. He says, well, Ken, what are you, nuts? We're not, that's not how it works. Got to come through a studio. Get him out of here. In the background, I see Sherry Redstone. She just happens to be She there. just happens to be walking by. She's running the place or uh, involved. Sherry comes over and she says, Judd, what's the situation? What's the problem? And he says, ah, this guy made a movie from around here. And it's on 35 million. Sherry said, Judd, look at one reel. What could it hurt? Throw it up. What could it hurt? Yep. Take a look at it. Judd's like, ah, I'll leave the film. I'll take a look. That night, I got a phone call. He said, I just watched your picture. I went, oh, no. He said, maybe one of the best independent movies I've ever seen. Wow. And then it, they put it on 20 screens in New England. Yeah. And it outgrossed Jurassic Park per screen. Right, right. In those theaters. Right. It, made, it, was, it was wildly successful. And you know what's so cool? It really inspired, and myself included, filmmakers who... Uh, you know, have been working on their career, but to see yeah. this can be done, a Rhode Islander can make a movie, and at that time, we didn't have the tools like people have now. They can make a movie on a the on their iPhone. Sure, but you did it, and and uh, and I have to give you so much kudos for being a Rhode Island filmmaking Hall of Famer. Oh, thank you. Truth, truthfully, thank you, Stephen. Um, so then, from there, 
Now you went to Pawtucket. Yeah. And this is 1994, 95, 95. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you took that project, American yeah, Buffalo, Buffalo, that was written by David Mamet. Yeah. And how did you get the rights? It was crazy. Everybody in town wanted the rights, and Hollywood wanted the rights. It had never been, De Niro wanted to do it, Pacino wanted to do it. Everybody wanted that project. Um, Dave Mamet had seen Federal Hill. He and I met, and he, like he was my hero. And he wrote The Untouchables. Oh, he wrote, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd been nom he wrote The Verdict, was right. nominated for an Oscar. Which in is the one of my favorite movies. So he saw Federal Hill. We talked. A 10-minute meeting turned into three hours in New York. He said, okay, you're the guy. And then I paid him a, a million dollars for the rights. Which you had play. with you at the time. Like I had it in cash. I right. It was in a gym <laughs> right. bag. It was in singles. So he gave you, he said, you got it. You got he it. said, can you afford the rights? I said, sure. And I went and got the money for the rights and uh, paid him. And then Dustin came on. And how did, now, how did you um, get Dustin? Uh, Dustin, uh, I reached out to him. I was in Los Angeles, staying in Steven Soderbergh's house in, 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 in L.A. at the time. And uh, Dustin had, like every other actor in, uh, in Hollywood, tracked the role of teaching American Buffalo. Turns out some dopey guy from Rhode Island ended up with the rights. He saw Federal and said, oh, this is an interesting movie, Michael. Right. I'll play that part. And so I met with him, and uh, he said... Uh, Let's do it. He said, can we shoot it in L.A.? I said, no. He said, what do you mean no? I said, no. We're going to shoot it in Rhode Island, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Yeah. We call it the bucket. Right. He's like, what does that mean? I said, well, you'll see. So he came to Rhode Island, and uh, we shot uh, American Buffalo right there by the old Leroy Theater. I met him in L.A. a few years ago, yeah. and I said, oh, Dustin Hoffman, you did American Buffalo in Pawtucket. He goes, it's Pawtucket. <laughs> Pawtucket. <laughs> it's Pawtucket, I exactly. Um, so Dustin Hoffman, who actually has a reputation of sometimes being difficult, yeah, um, but... Uh, you know, like a marathon man, apparently he yeah. got so absorbed in his character, he didn't sleep for days, and mm. Laurence uh, Olivier said, uh, my boy, why don't you just act? How was Dustin Hoffman, because I'm a big fan of his work, yeah. how was he to work with, and um, did he like to rehearse, not rehearse? Dustin uh, liked rehearsing. We did a lot of read-throughs. We did a lot of rehearsing. Uh, Dennis Franz also liked to rehearse because Dennis came out of the theater. You know, I've heard horror, st horror stories about Dustin and Alec Baldwin and Bobby Duvall and all. Never had a problem with right. any of right. them. Guys like that don't show up to make movies like the kind of movies I make to give you a hard time. Dustin was probably one of the hardest working actors I've ever worked with, as was Robert Duvall. And the people, though, I think when, you know, hard time, I think it's just they want to do excellent work. Yes. That's Dustin. That's exactly right. what it right. was. Right. He wants to do excellent work. Can I do work. one more take? Can I do one more take? Right. And then right. certain boy, you have to say, there's no more time. You right. have to move on. Right. Um, he was brilliant. And he was great in the editing room. Yeah. Gives you a lot of different oh, options. Yeah, yeah, Would yeah. he ask for uh, an extra take and try to give you something different? Oh, yeah. Always trying. Yeah, we had what was said. It would say it right on the slate, the roof falling in scene. Because I would say to him, Dustin, this is the last take. I, I don't care if the roof falls in. Oh, okay. And then That's they right. would put it right on fit. Right. Roof falling in take. That meant we weren't doing anything. Is there anything you learned by working with him? With Dustin? Yeah. Oh, about yeah. About your own craft of yeah, a, yeah. as Dustin a director? Yeah, all about being specific. Be specific. As specific as you possibly can. Because it, it makes an actor stay in the moment. Did he um, like to get a lot of direction or a little direction? He would take whatever he could get. Dustin was just take it all in. He really yeah. wanted to do the best he possibly could. Deal and Dennis with. Franz, same thing? Well, or Dennis is he Franz, well, Dennis Franz was a different story. Like, Dennis Franz was from Chicago. Dennis Franz grew up in the theater with Dave Mamet. Right. Dennis Franz opened his mouth. He could have been talking in his sleep. And I would have photographed it with that particular role. Like right. Donnie, right. he, you know, he, he just couldn't screw up. He was, yeah. he was perfection in right. that role. That was, that was Donnie. Right. What makes you such an authority on life all of a sudden? My life, Don, and the way I've lived it. Get teach an English muffin. I don't want an English muffin. Get him an English muffin and make sure they give you the jelly. I found a nickel. I like it because of the art on it. Uh-huh. Because it looks like something. Is this worth anything? 
You don't want me to do the job? Not now. We aren't going to do it now. You tell me when you want me to do it. I don't know that I want you to do it at this point. So what was this thing with the kid? I mean, is there anything, uh... No, it's nothing, you know. You want to tell me what this thing is? Well, what about the thing? The thing? Yeah. No, it's nothing. Oh, you know. No, I don't know. What is it? So, <laughs> It was so, made. It was written yeah. for him, right? Dennis would go bop it, bop it, bop it, bop it, boom, and <laughs> cut, and I'd be like, "Okay, that's great." And they'd say, "You want to do another take?" And I'd say, "No." We're good. And Dustin would be like, "You sure you don't want to do one more take?" I got it, Dustin. How come he always gets it in one shot? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> On that laugh, let's go to outside Providence. Yeah. Because now you are working with the Farrellys, who are your longtime friends. Yeah, we we started with outside Providence before I made Federal Hill. And before they made Dumb and Dumber, I picked up the book Outside Providence in the Hamptons where I was living on the dollar a bookshelf for a buck. You buy a book. I saw Outside Providence. I bought it. I read it. I thought, this is a movie. Yeah. I hadn't made any movies. Pete yeah. and Bobby hadn't made any movies. Yeah. I called, got Pete Farrelly in L.A. He said, yeah, yeah, sure, you can have the rights for a dollar. Take it. Go make the movie. I said, okay, but I got to make this movie first called Federal Hill. He said, yeah, we got to make a movie called Dumb and Dumber. Now think about that, Stephen. These three knuckleheads, me, Pete, and Bobby, talking about, oh, I have to make this movie before we can make that, that movie. movie. The odds of that happening are astronomical. The fact that we both made those films, then I made American Buffalo, they made Kingpin, and then finally we said, we have to do Outside Providence. And, and this is a book that Peter wrote. A book called Outside Providence, yep. yeah. And, and um, then we adapted it to yep. the screen, me, Bobby, and Pete, yep. and Mike Cerrone. Yep. And then... Uh, then uh, once the script got uh, finished, we went to Paramount, and they said, okay, we'll make it. And then they put it on the shelf, and I knew they were going to do that. So I raised enough money to take it off the shelf and raised the money to shoot it and shot it all here, as you know, at URI and at the Armory. And, and that's where you and I met, at the that's Armory. Right. I remember you giving me a tour while you were doing Yeah, that. yeah, raising yeah. money in between <laughs> takes. I don't recommend that. Thing. No. no. It was insanity. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and how was that? That was when you worked with Alec Baldwin for the first time. The first time. time, yeah. Yeah. How was he to work with? Alec Baldwin was an absolute peach. It, 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 both times I've worked with him, yeah. uh, he, you know, he knows more about filmmaking and the craft and the art of acting than most actors forgot. Yeah. Uh, uh, or he forgot more than most actors know, I should say. Uh, he was just amazing. He would see me in the weeds and he would say, I know you need a two shot and I know what you're trying to get. Why don't I just turn this way, I'll, I'll look down the barrel of the lens, then you can just adjust this way and you can get a two shot and a single at the same time. And I'd be like, well, yeah, what he said. And Isn't that great, though, too? I mean, there's a guy who understands, and you being also open to the yeah. art of collaboration. Oh, yeah. That this is a collaborative medium. Oh, yeah. And that, um, because I was talking to another director who uh, told me he was on a project. He goes, Steve, I was stuck. Sure. I was stuck, but thank God he was working with Glenn Close. Yeah. And Glenn Close was, well, why don't we just like totally remove the table? Yeah. And then we, and he was like, okay. can we do that? <laughs> can we do that? And he realized, it took the pressure off of him. Of course. Knowing that he had a pro working with him. And not, no one person makes a movie by themselves. Right. Unless you're in the woods photographing a tree. Right, exactly. But still you need to get it processed and you need it <laughs> anyway. Alec Baldwin was amazing in both films that I, I worked on with him. He, he you know, he, he was just fantastic. Yeah. And, and he was great in Outside Providence. I mean, that role oh, for him yeah. at that point in his career, a lot of people noticed his work in that. He, he, he was heartbreaking. You know, and then he, he is one of those guys that can cross genres. I oh. mean, he could be in Outside Providence. Oh. Then he could be doing the Tina Fey. Yeah. Then he can go into Mission Impossible. Yeah. yeah. And, he, yeah, he's phenomenal. After that, you went to Scotland, isn't that I, the next move? I went move? to Scotland, yeah. After Outside Providence, made a movie with Robert Duvall in Scotland about a... So he played a soccer, a Scottish soccer coach, older uh, gentleman, uh, uh, late in his career, the, the Scottish soccer a, coach. A shot uh, at glory, right? That's a shot name? at glory, yeah. Yep. Uh, and it was an opportunity for me. I loved soccer growing up, and, uh, I, you know, an opportunity to work with Duvall was... How, amazing. I mean, he's one of the, he's... Amazing, amazing. He, he's another one who... Uh, the best, I mean, really. Is, yeah, there, there's Bobby's no... the first one on the set, the last one to leave, another one at his age. Let's go, let's do another one, come on. You know, it's funny. You know, I heard the stories from Dustin about, because 
Dustin Hoffman and Robert Duvall were roommates. And Gene Hackman. And Gene Hackman. Well, they were separate. Right. Dustin lived with Gene and uh, Dustin lived with Bobby. Uh, but uh, the, the, the stories were incredible and they were uh, remarkably the same. Right. And I've been lucky, you know, to have to work with a guy like Duvall, who's, who's another one who just, it's all about the work. It's about the character. There's no magic pixie dust. This business is not about... Uh, anything uh, uh, coming out of the stars. It's just hard work. So when you were getting a, a script, you gave the script to Robert Duvall, and, I, and you had Michael Keaton also on yeah. that project, right? Yeah. So you're getting the project to a Robert Duvall. Is he asking you questions, or are you asking him? Like, what's the, the communication back and forth? Uh, again, Rehearsal, no rehearsal, some, uh, and you, uh, you have yeah, to ask yeah, these Dustin actors. Dustin loved rehearsal, Alec didn't want to rehearse, uh, Bobby, D Duvall did not need to rehearse, didn't want to rehearse. Uh, he, uh, he would ask questions about what I thought early on, and then once we got into a rhythm, it was just, okay, here we go. D Robert Duvall does not like to be given a mark, just sort of say, okay, somewhere in here, and you look at the cameraman and say, well, it's going to be somewhere in there. It, so you, you know, have to be flexible yeah, with, with, Robert, with, Duvall. with Robert, Robert Duvall. Yeah, he, he doesn't like marks on the floor. He, doesn't, he wants to take as much of the mechanics as he can out of it and try and keep it as natural as possible. Yeah, and so he's organic. Very right? organic and funny, very funny. And are you, um, are you, uh, does that change how you work as a director when you're dealing sure. with Sure. Tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you know, you, it's, it's just like acting. You're only as good as the person sitting across from you. You know, you, you, you sort of take hints and cues from your talent that uh, they're going to work in a certain way or they aren't, and you know when they want another take, or you know when you've got it and they know when you've got it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's always a collaboration, would always you, a collaboration. Would you talk to him uh, in a whisper? Would you talk to him in front of the crew? Like, let's say... Uh, he. You weren't sure, and you didn't know if you wanted another take. Would that be something you would talk to him quietly and say? Not at all. Not Bobby. No, but wow, look, let's get a couple more, son. Okay, let's go. Okay, right. I think I'm done with this one. Okay, Bobby, let's okay. move the lights. <laughs> okay, so he would. Really oh yeah, like yeah, you. yeah. Unless there was a problem, he'd say, a "Problem? No." Or yeah, it was sound. Or could we? If that was a ten, could we try this at a seven? Got it. Okay, sure. That's about as much direction as you give a guy like Robert Duvall. Because he's a Hall of Famer. Well, he's just... He's... Yeah, he's just he's, like... Or Dustin, too. I mean, Dustin's got no, two No, I'm Oscars. saying these are... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, but Dustin wanted it. Where would I? Where did I miss it? What was the beat? Did I, should, should I have hit... Blah, 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 blah. Right. Uh, but... But you are working with the top of yeah. the top of the top. Yeah. As far as actors yes. are concerned. Because there's a language that they... If they know you understand that language, they're comfortable. A lot of actors, it's their ass out there, Stephen. Yeah. Can I say that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, they trust that you know what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes it's not a bad thing to say to an actor, I'm not sure about this moment. Right. Let's figure it out. Let's explore it on camera. Let's try a couple of different things. Which is, this is a good question now. The script, before you get to rehearsals, before or you give them the script, um, when you're... If you've written the script, yeah, uh, how flexible are you with? It, it depends on the actor. It depends on the material. Oftentimes, if it's something that I've written, or if it's a piece of material that I'm, you know, like Adapted. American Buffalo was basically set in concrete or, or, or stone, um, I would say to actors, you know, let's just do a couple the way it's written, and then we'll do a couple where I'm just going to say go. I, I don't say action. I, when everybody's ready to go, they mark it, they, they tell me the sound and lights are ready, and I say to an actor, we're ready whenever you are. Yeah. And they begin. Uh, so ordinarily, I get a couple of the way it's written, two or three takes, and then when I'm happy with that, I say, let's explore. Let's find a, a happy accident. Yeah. So don't you think, too, when you're working with a guy like a Robert Duvall or Dustin Hoffman or yeah. Alec Baldwin, um, uh, Richard Jenkins, too, right? Yeah. Um, You've cast these wonderful people. Yeah. You want them to, you want them to do their fizz, of their course. work. You yeah. want, you've hired yeah. them, and they are professionals. They oh. are the best. So you want to let them. Let them go. Let them go. It's like Mike Cerrone in Outside Providence. Everybody was like, are you sure he could play Kavich? And I would say, trust me, this guy can do it. And, oh, that we could get a big name. I said, no, 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 he's, he's perfect for that. He, in fact, he was so good and so funny in that. Baldwin would look at me. 
and say, I can't do this. And I'd say, what? He'd say, I can't even look at this guy because I'm going to lose it. And there are, there's outtakes. Right. There are outtakes where Alec Baldwin's looking over at Mike Cerrone with that dopey Christmas hat on and the card table. Thing. And I look at Baldwin, and he's just like, he lost it. Right. And there were times where I had to say, okay, you can go to your trailer, Alec, <laughs> and I'll just shoot Michael out in, his two, in a two-shot or a three-shot. He was, he was so good. Right. It was, That's fun. Anyway. <laughs> and you're having fun, too. I mean, oh, that's, that's yeah. key, right? Well, and working with Pete and Bobby Farrelly. Yeah. Well, you know them. Yep, they, yep. they do not get any sweeter than that. And they do pranks. They do pranks, and they, but I, I mean, it, it, they're, they're, they're just the sweetest, they, most honest. I think Bobby person. gave me a pen. He goes, Oh, Steve, will you sign? Uh, give, give me your phone number and sign. And the, the, of, the pen was electric. Of course it was. <laughs> well, how about Pete right now? <laughs> Golden Eddie, Globes? Yeah, Golden Globes. Hey, great work, those guys, the, oh. the, the Green Book. Um, so then he did Brooklyn Rules. Yeah. He also did Brotherhood. Uh, yeah. He did an episode with um, Jason Isaacs, Jason Clark. We filmed that here in Rhode Island. Yeah. How was that? Uh, oh, I loved that. You that jumped was my into first. TV. That was my first foray into television, and uh, I loved it. You know, it was interesting. Everybody says, oh, TV and film is different. No difference as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Because of the way I make movies, Stephen, it's independent film. It's same thing with television. You shoot six, eight pages a day in an independent film. You do the same thing in television. Right. So I enjoyed it. I loved working with those people. One camera or two on on, on, uh, I, on they, the were, they, they were a couple of cameras if you needed them, but, you know, predominantly single camera. Yep. Um, do you prefer using one camera or two? Yeah, it, it depends. I mean, it, it's good to have the extra camera body if you need it, and it can s save time, like, if we're shooting you in a scene like this, I'd just as soon have you in a wide and a medium, right. if I could. It, yeah. it, it saves some time. I'll tell you what, though. That one of the more gifted actors I've ever worked with was that Jason Isaacs. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. Scary talented. Yeah. Smart. Oof. Very keen. But just yeah. reminds me a lot of working with Alec. Yeah. Very. Just so smart and can do comedy and drama and just the, the turning by turning around. It's amazing. Yeah. He, he's a smart, one of the smartest guys I've yeah. ever met. Yeah. Um, you're now working on a, di a new project, right? Yes. What, uh, well, about five years ago, uh, uh, I go back and forth with Steven Soderberg a lot. We've known Steven each other Soderberg, for 25 years. Steven Soderberg, did Aaron years. Brockovich, yeah. Sex, Lies, and Videotape, the Ocean's Eleven movies. and Got the Oscar for the, uh, Traffic. And, yep, um, Traffic, right. Yeah, um, and known him forever since Federal Hill. And he told me five years ago, get into TV. The stories you want to tell and I want to tell belong on that screen. And I, I thought about it, and then I realized he was right. Rather than try and jam everything into 90 minutes or 120 minutes, take one, two, three, four seasons to tell the story you want to tell. So I started writing television, and uh, I wrote something that I handed to Stephen, a pilot, and created it. And he went nuts over it. And hired me, him and his partner, Philip Fleischman, hired me to go on and write the rest of the episodes, which I did with another writer, Greg Poirier, and a great writer. And, um, and you have 10 episodes now? We have eight episodes, eight episodes completed. The series is ready to go, and uh, can't really get into too much detail, but it's a, another Rhode Island story that would shoot here and we're looking forward to that too yeah. and um how does it feel being able to explore the characters um because you're not confined to that oh it's a it's just a blessing it's so much fun Stephen, to know that you can just develop these these characters and not have to oh no i've got to jam them into the second act of this movie and then resolve it in the third act and it's over you can just let them unfold and the story is about rhode island it's about providence it's about the people that I know and grew up around, and composites of all of them. And as you and I both know, here in Rhode Island, those stories are endless. Yeah, that is true. They just go on. <laughs> only forever. in Rhode only Island. Only in Rhode Island. They go on forever. Well, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, for Double Feature, and I want to wish you a lot of success on the new show, and the best of health always. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, pal. Thank you.